Welcome to the Contractor Freedom Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Phillips. This show exists to help small business owners like you escape tyranny, a contractor prison, and enter the bliss of contractor freedom so that you can have the time, money, and freedom to live your life with purpose beyond your business. As the owner of a multi-million dollar home improvement company and certified human behavior consultant, I'll be sharing with you skills for life, love, leadership, and business. I'll also be connecting you with experts that can help you scale your business and your life. So if you want to build the business and the life of your dreams, then you are in the right place. Let's go. Hello, painting contractors. It is a beautiful day here in Dallas, Texas, and I have something special for you today. And we're not coming to you from the studio today. I actually have a very special guest that hails all the way from Walla, Washington, and it's Miss Annie Newton. Annie, I'm so glad you are here today that you came by to visit. Uh, I was so delighted to get the invite. So t tell me, you're in town. What are you in town for? I came down for the CFO conference that was being hosted in downtown Dallas. CFO conference. We're going to have to chat about that here in a few minutes. <laughs> it sounds I, super important. I, and <laughs> but I, I bet it is. I'm sure, I'm sure that it's important. You're a woman in the paint business. Yes, I am. And which is becoming a more of a normal thing these days. Isn't it so awesome to see? It is It is really awesome to see. Actually, for me, it's awesome on a personal level because I have four daughters. And um, three of my daughters have already worked for the company. One's about to retire. One already left me. But <laughs> yeah, so not necessarily painting, but sure. in, in sales. Love and it. so there's definitely some challenges that yeah. uh, and some biases that she's run into. I'll have her on here sometime and, and uh, you guys can all hear her story. And I bet the, I bet the women in paint would love it. <laughs> but I'm super glad you're here. You, you and I have been friends for, I don't remember when we met. Do you remember when we met? It's feeling about 10 years ago. Yeah. And I believe it was probably a PCA. PCA event. thing. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. How did you get in the painting business? Oh, it's a great story. And I'll give you the really short version. 2002, my brother had started a painting company and it was about a year in. And then there's that side called paperwork and taxes. And, and he scaled really quickly and there was some troubles brewing and he just really needed some help. So I joined at that time and I needed to be rescued. I was in a really tough place. We just lost our son. Nolan had just died. And two weeks later, I had an, another child. But the reason to get out of bed and go do the things of life was really challenged. It was really a God event. He showed up, would whisk away the crying baby, and I would put my attention on that. It was a paint company. I didn't know anything about painting. I didn't know anything about running a company or financials and just dove in and it became a welcome distraction. Wow. That is an yeah. amazing story. What an opportunity to refocus your time at a difficult time in your life. I think I know the answer to this, but have you ever been a painter? I have not. You have not been a painter. Okay, me either. Not. Me either. Yeah. So you came in really specifically working on the business end of it with the paperwork and such. With an operations focus. An um, operations focus. I've always loved scaling. I actually had a robotics background. And so those two don't really mesh together. Now we know it's becoming a thing, right? But the love of systems and the love of leverage and scaling. And it was just a gift to be able, able to work alongside with my brother. Looking back became Four Seasons U University and it became a platform to really discover strengths and to pour into others and leadership. And it just turned on all these elements in life that made life more full. Sounds to me like you took what you were really good at and paired it with what he was really good at. Yes. And together you guys were, were like a dynamic duo. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the things I'm passionate about is having a well-rounded team. Yes. And it sound, sounds like your brother very and you very shortly connected and figured that out pretty quickly. And I didn't figure that out quite so quickly. I think we probably had an advantage. We spoke a similar language where two of 10 kids were Irish twins, just 11 months between us. And so in the middle of the clan, I was number four, he was number five, I'm the big, bigger sister. It just, we could communicate by just looking in each other's eyes and go, okay, yep, this one's going south. Are you gonna be good cop or bad cop role? And we could tell each other that just with our eyes as we had things come up and auditors who walk into your office and all the things that happen over 18 years of a painting company. So you did it for 18 years, yeah. right? But now you're in town for uh, 
a CFO conference. Yes. T yeah. Tell us a little about that. What a wild journey, right? I believe I was the only one in the room without the letters, three letters, either CPA or CMA or one of those things behind my name. I have fallen in love with numbers and the art of running a business by being in a small business. I think there's tremendous opportunity in the service business. As we see the challenges, a lot of companies were there were SaaS and e-commerce and other things, and there is fear on their face. The market is uncertain. And we get to instead have such controls that they're jealous of. Private equity is own, is eyeing everything we're doing because we're such a sweet spot. I think sometimes we can see the struggles of running a service-based business. It requires a lot of labor. It has its challenges. It also has this beautiful buffer because it's not super easy to do. That's the buffer. So we talked about strategies, the requirements of banking industry as the bank is looking forward and they're nervous. They let that trickle down and they're writing covenants on our line of credits and they're tightening things up. More and more important to have a really good cash flow forecast. What are you looking at for money? Be able to communicate in the language of financials. It's not just giving the bank your financials. You've got to invite them into the story of why they bank on you. Wow. Whether or not you use that line of credit, you right. need it there. You need it as a safety so, net. Yeah. It was just fun for the first time to be amongst peers. It's a relatively new thing to be a fractional CFO. So instead of hiring a full-time CFO, perhaps you're just getting a couple hours a week. You're getting guidance on running the business. And someone brought up a really good point and it just really resonated with me. They said, look 10 years ago at a small business and what a business owner understood about financials. And then you look at today and it, the game has been increased. So we have short TikToks that give you education on tax strategies to other things. Not all the info is good, by the way. We had some good laughs on some very bad advice out there between YouTube education that the business owner today stands so much more educated and their knowledge base of how to run a business is much higher than it's ever been. So it's an interesting dynamic, but it also means the bank is increasing their demands. You're bonding. Now they have different requirements if you're about five mil and you touch commercial, they say, give me a whip report. So the requirements in a, a small business is increasing. You're making me think about this old formula of how life survives is L has to be greater than C, which I, don't, I didn't even know this in school. I guess it's a, I don't know if it's a biology term or what it is, but your rate of learning has to be greater than the rate of change that's happening around you. And we're in a changing world. Yeah. And you know, according to Moore's law, it's changing very rapidly, but I think you make a great point is the business owner of 10 years ago, whether you're a small business or a big business, it's completely different. It really is. And so as business owners, we need to be not just running our business. We need to be constantly learning new things. So that's, man, that's a really, that's a really a great point. And I'm thinking about our, I'm thinking about our, our listeners. Of course, I, the, the ones that are listening to podcasts like this, they're already going to be growth mindset yes. people, right? Yeah. Or if they're not, they soon will be. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, so help me understand or help us understand in a few hours a week as a fractional CFO, what are, first of all, what are the indicators, the pain points that if I'm a small business person, let's just say I'm the new guy, I don't know what a, CFO, sure. a fractional CFO is. What are the pain points that I'm experiencing that a fractional CFO could solve for me? Sure. Maybe let's put a little context around it, depending, because I'm sure there's, when we talk about the listeners here, some have say, hey, I'm at that million dollar point, somewhere I'm at three, I'm five, I'm 10. We, the business is going to have a variety of needs. And in our world, sometimes there isn't a need so much for a fractional CFO as there is of controllership services. And there's a difference between the two, but our industry knows it, that we're going to give it a name and the name is CFO. If you hold a budget, if you don't have a budget for your business, sometimes that's hard to do. That may be an indicator that you need more than bookkeeping. So bookkeeping is in the rearview mirror, how did you do it? And it's historical. If you find yourself asking, I wonder how much money I might need. I wonder how many man hours we need to hit break even. It's winter. How do we hit break even? How can we project for how much we might lose? When you're asking those questions of how much, what are we looking at? 
what needs to be true, what does success look like. Many times that's different than bookkeeping. A good set of books is super important. But when you find you're, you're looking out the front windshield, that's when we need to be talking about the predictive. We need to live at, and I think as owners of businesses, I think an indicator of a good owner outside of financial even is those who live in the predictive. Okay, so you're making me think of a question I get asked fairly often. Hey, Jason, I, I need to hire a project manager or a salesperson. How am I going to pay for that person? I give them my logic on how to make that decision. Is that a, a situation you run into fairly often on how do I pay for this new employee? Or how much work do I have to do so I can then have that be true? And usually that's not a single answer. It becomes like an agreement. If they're going to bring X, then this is where you hit break even. And the requirement should be this. So it brought you forward. We are scared of a few things, making decisions that where we feel like we have success right now may pull us out of being successful. Yes. And that, and it's a valid fear. You can, feel, you can be as critical as you want here. I'm going to tell you back in the day, the logic that I would use when I was, when I was spread too thin and I needed to put a manager in place and create a new position, not replace a manager or a position, but create a new position. The thought process that I would use is I would say, what's on an annualized basis, what's that position going to cost me? Okay. Let's just use some easy numbers. You want to choose a number, 50,000, 100,000, whatever it is in your market. Sure. Okay. And I say, okay, if, if I took that money out of savings and just annied it all up hundred percent right now, and so I, in 12 months, what would need to be true in 12 months for me to say, this was a great decision. And I, obviously one of those things that would come to mind would be revenue and we know that not all revenue that you generate is contribution profit. So I would just back in, okay, I'm going to get, I'm going to get this much contribution profit, although it would hurt my, although it would hurt my net profit if I just created an enough extra to break even, right. to break even on the money, technically that would make my net profit go smaller, but it could have a profound impact on my life and the time it freed me up. So that was one aspect of it. And the other one is, what do I would need? What would I need for this person to add? So, what would we need to produce in order to maintain or improve the net profit? So, I'd have this kind of this best and worst case scenario, and okay, so what's the most likely scenario? And then, if, if that made sense to me, then I would, if I had the right person, I would pull the trigger. So that, that was my own logic. That I nobody coached me through that. I didn't have someone like you back in the day. Tell me what's I, wrong with what I just. Did. I don't think I'd pull that apart and say it's wrong because even that framework of bouncing back and forth, you're going through the process. Is it necessary right now? So what's the cost if I don't do this? And I think that's sometimes what we don't ask. Some, most of the time we're saying, so how much is this going to cost me? But did we take the time to say, what if I don't? What if a PM could influence the gross profit by 2%? In some cases, that's just covered their entire overhead. Yes. So if they could just influence just that small amount, could you, does it free you up to do more sales? What does this look like? What about the team underneath them? Are you actually by, what's the cost of not hiring? Are you potentially looking at either a sub crew or your own crews losing out because the access to you, you're trying to run everything yourself, becoming fractured. They're frustrated. They had a question on a job. You couldn't get back to them until seven o'clock that night. So what's the cost of that? What would it be for someone else to walk in and say, hey, I have a couple projects for you, and they have a PM who's very responsive. So it's more than numbers, if that makes sense. Yes. You know, that again, you're taking me down memory lane. Wow. Not that's ever happened <laughs> that you responded to someone at 7 p.m. about a question. Oh, never. <laughs> <laughs> Annie, um, the, one of the things that I realized as I started, I literally, it, it took faith yeah. to make these decisions. Anyways, I would get to this point of, well, I think I can do it. The numbers look right but you have to take a leap of faith, right? And, and as, I, as I would do this, I started realizing, wow, I was doing such a terrible job at that. The very fact that this person, maybe they're not quote as good as me, but they have 100% of their attention. They're gonna get way better than me really quick. And that situation with, with their attention is gonna be attended to way better than I was attending to. And I started to realize how spread so thin in the roles that I was personally fulfilling in my company. I was doing a terrible job. 
And so when I started filling those roles, we just went, we had a very dramatic increase in revenue as I began to focus my, specialize my time down into different areas. Do you see the same thing? I do. And I also think you might also find that this resonates with you. We suddenly find ourselves in a position where we're now becoming a leader of leaders. And it's such a different skill set. I think that is quite the jump. It's not, did you need 50K to cover that role, even if they were they had some bonusing out based on co- commissions tied to the gross profit? What did it require of me as a leader? Was there clear expectations in place? Did they know what winning looked like? And sometimes that can be overwhelming. One of the things that I've, I find in myself, and I think a lot of leaders do, maybe not someone with more of a detail-oriented personality like yourself, okay, <laughs> But a lot of the people are, okay, we're great at motivating and inspiring people. But when it comes down to simple clarity and giving that other person a picture of winning, it's hard it to create hard. simple clarity. Even in something that's not even numbers-based, but people struggle creating and drafting and defining their core values for their company. And so something that should be so simple is not. So... If we're talking about, hey, I've got this position, how do I define what success looks like in that position? Is that something that you help people with? It's something I've done a lot. It's not necessarily in the list of offerings, but it pops up as you're talking about money. If money isn't performing in the way that we want, we just start peeling it back. So what might beat off? If they didn't hit that, did they know they weren't hitting it? What? How did this impact their wallet if they didn't hit it? Right. You just, it becomes a very organic conversation. Right. And most of the time I feel so protective because we're running fast and hard. But most of the time it points back to us as leaders that we didn't quite give the framework for them to bounce between the edges and be successful. And what an amazing thing, an incredible thing when I walked in the door this morning and I see dashboards per department up on the wall and it says what winning looks like for the day and all the metrics that didn't happen overnight. And I just think what a gift to be a team member on your team and to not, in general, we attract really hard workers and really good people. Yes. We do. Like it, it's the rare thing, not rare, but it's less common that we have a non-performer. In general, we have performers and really good people. And I feel very passionate that they are deserving after a very hard day of work. What's terrible is when they go home and they don't know if it was a big enough impact. Did it move the needle enough? Do we ever want to do sports where we someone's not keeping track of the score, right? But that's like business. And it's that balance between giving ourselves grace as we're scaling. We know we can't have all the things as we, we go forward. But I also think uh, today there's an expectation as people say yes and they hitch their wagon to ours that they're ex- expecting more from us. And that can feel like pressure, I think, on the shoulders of the leader. 100%. You're right. It's... Do our people, it's not fair to say, hey, it's the end of the month. Let me tell you something that happened to me one time. And this, I had one of my people at the end of the month thought they hit their goal. Mm. And they didn't. And it was such a demoralizing, demotivating, air out of the balloon moment for this person because they thought they were winning and they weren't. I had not created clarity. It was, this one was simple numbers. This person did not have access to the simple numbers that were accurate to tell them where they were winning or losing. This happened just a few years ago. And it was a wake up call to me. I'm like, you mean this guy has been, this guy's been working all month thinking he's ahead. And in reality, he didn't have the right data and he actually was behind. And he lost. How do you think he felt? How do you think that employee felt? Okay. And then how did I feel as the manager, leader, owner in my company? I felt horrible, horrible. I made it right. It's on, it's on me to create that clarity. And then once you do that now, okay, he can, this is a gauge he can rely on. And it's, man, it just, that, that was terrible. And I'm, I am big that leaders go first. Leaders lead with trust, take the risk, and it's on us to create the clarity. That's what I think. Is it's pretty much what you were saying, but just talking to you, I'm so many 
memory you're, lane. You're, yeah, they're typically not good memories, though, the, Andy. They're all the things, the mistakes I've made. <laughs> but I think that's the platform. You walk into the office and you see clearly, like, people are operating in their roles in their department and they're owning the sex the success and the metrics of each one of that, it was on the back of a lot of bad decisions, but they weren't bad enough that they took you out. It was sometime that momentum of that was so painful. I'm putting things into place that will never happen again. And it's, that's a healthy thing when you're like, that will never happen again. We have that conversation around here a lot. There's a lot of profit holes in business. Yes. A lot of places that the the leads leak, the profits leak everywhere. It's holes in our bucket. So what, yes, exactly. What are some common things that in the, spe specifically in the painting industry, I know you work outside the painting industry these days, Yeah. but what are some tip common thread of issues that you wish owners knew or could solve or want to help them solve? Wow. Uh, so many places you could take that question. Maybe I'll pop up to some of the larger clients that I deal with kind of in that 10 mil range we're seeing things on the market that the leads are becoming very expensive. So put throwing money at that with anticipating certain results. What if we continue on that current trajectory? If we've seen an increase of 35% from last year to this year, have we ran the model to say if that did it again between 23 and 24 and what happens between 24 and 25? And do we have other data out there that says this could become a reality? What impact is that? How should it in influence our business model? Are we suddenly looking at a division of work that we may not have considered? Yes. What's the numbers on hiring a rock star hunter, a prospector? Suddenly we could take a piece of that budget and if it's attached to two or three mil and that can be turned in 12 months, what's yes. the rate of return? What's the return on effort? So there's some silent things that I'm that have caught my eye that I'm seeing as a trend. It's an interesting thing. And if it continues, um, there's always opportunities in these things. Have we positioned ourselves for the opportunity? I hope I didn't go too deep or I want to make sure this is relevant. No, that was great. No, that's, de this. that's definitely relevant because when leads are slow and you're a, a spread too thin business owner, it's easy to swipe that credit card on Google or Facebook. Yeah. And up your spend. Just like every other competitor contractor is doing. They're just spending more. And that's, there's no more necessarily leads there. We're just paying more for them on the platforms and the platforms are winning. So what, one of the things I want to do is I also want to reach them where they're more exclusive leads. I had a conversation a few years ago at, at an event with a young lady. I say you know, young lady, but she was pretty seasoned in the industry. And she was telling me about managing canvassing teams. Now, nobody likes to knock on doors. I say nobody, almost nobody. That's how I started my business. And I didn't like it, but I did what I had to do. So we were talking and there were a number of people at our table. And so there's some people were, wow, really? You're not you canvassing? Y'all got all your leads from canvassing? And she's like, yeah. And she said, let me tell you what I like about canvassing leads. There's never another competitor. They're exclusive leads. And it, again, it was a throwback. I'm like, that is so true. But it took, it takes effort. You can't swipe a credit card to do that. So how does, how should it influence our business model? I think we need to learn to generate leads and build relationships instead of just swipe credit cards for yes. marketing. And that's one of the things we're doing at our company is reallocating some spend into manpower. Of course, manpower needs to be leveraged and, sure. and I don't want to say managed but you've got to empower people to really go after the results. So I see that as well. For sure. I think maybe the other place I'm seeing right now is um, in Texas, we don't have some of the restrictions when it comes to subcontracting that we have in other parts of the country. So where you're limited almost only to having W-2 employees as part of your staff, and we know how hard it is to hire. And that labor struggle is a real thing. I think we could up our game by really breaking out by division and segment and type of work. What is the most profitable work? What's our revenue per hour? What's our revenue per, pro per profit, right? And so if we say yes, being careful about our yes. What I'm seeing in a lot of companies, it's not that they're lacking the sold work. They have the 15, 20, 25, 30,000 man hours sold, but looking at what type of man hours have been sold. 
And so their bottleneck is on the labor end. Yeah. So let's put the most profitable work through the funnel. Yes. And that may not be, that sounds super basic, but do this, does the sales team know that? Is that what they're being incentivized to go pursue and to turn in? So it may not be the easiest sales. That's a, that is a great, that is a great thought. And I'm wondering how many guys and gals are listening to this right now. I think that's a great conversation to have with yourself. Are you measuring your profitability? I know most people these days are measuring their profitability per project, but how about per segment? Let's just say interior versus exterior painting or commercial versus residential or whatever it is. Do you segment those out and measure the, the, the profit per hour, the cost of the customer acquisition cost and all of that? Is that really the work you need to be working on? And there's times of the year where you're like, hey, I just need to keep my guys busy, especially for companies up north, like where you were. We had an interesting conversation about that earlier. And I'd like for you to maybe just chat about that. Because I, I used to think back in the day that, hey, our seasonal curve here in <laughs> Dallas, Texas is tough, man. We've got a, a slow winter that January and February and a big spring. But then I talked to people like you up north, and it's a whole different game of how you have to scale and keep busy in the winter. So could you share a moment yeah. about that, some yeah. strategies for that? Yeah, it's the winter mindset. Like for some, like you pointed out, winter isn't the year around conversation. But if you're up north in, in July, you're talking about winter. In July. And sometimes as painting contractors, we have this ability where we like look at each other and we're like, what you doing right now? And we're looking at the sexy numbers of summer. Ooh, ah, man, crap. We just broke another barrier. And I often like to go, Talk to me about your winter. How you can go protect your winter often indicates to what can, how can you retain your team? It's a strategic move. You can talk about selling flex scheduling work. You can have some alignment with facility work, maintenance contracts, be willing to go, hey, I'd like to meet up with you for your annual budget walk and I'll help you allocate the dollars. You don't have the sale yet. It's a line, it's that prospecting, but what you're doing is you're filling up your bucket. So in January, you've turned on everything and you're recruiting, you're recruiting leadership and painters and you're finding people sitting on their couch. If you're a business owner in July and you're up north, especially, you probably shouldn't be spending all your time on projects. You need to be laying down that track for yes. the winter. Yes, because it's the response versus the proactive, right? You're responding to the pile of leads that are coming in and your calendar for sales rep is full. But is there any time blocking for some of those activities that are not the urgent and right in front of you? And I just think there's such a strategic advantage with aligning yourself with work. Back um, in my early days, Annie, I knew a guy that this really set an example for me. He would, he would be so super busy running all of his work. He would get his work done. Then he wouldn't have any work to do. He would go sell his equipment to the pawn shop. Then eventually he would sell some work and then go buy his equipment out of the pawn shop. Oh, and this was a cycle over and over because he wasn't allocating his time to future things. And I know as a small business owner, if you are still like operating, maybe doing the sales, the project management, and especially if you're actually doing the, doing some of the actual service work, that's super hard to do. It really is. It's not easy, but, but that's, you know, if you can build a team, empower them with some simple systems, you can free yourself up to then go build a better future and make everybody's life better. For sure. I watched a situation a couple of years ago where a team had pre-sold quite a bit of work. Thousands of matters were sitting there and sales reps were sitting back and they're like, we're good. We're good. We have 17,000 man hours. We're, we're, I don't know what you're talking about. We're really good. But hours hadn't been divided between exterior and interior. And there was less than a thousand amount hours sold for interior. And the winter was coming. Yes. Of wow. course, the exterior isn't going to be produced going to be put on when able to be produced is when it's going to be sold or worked. And so not having clarity about the things that were, yeah, we're trying to fill up the bucket of hours, but was it the right type of hours? And, wow. And it was very devastating what it did to their first quarter. And by the time they realized they had the problem, it was very hard to recover. Wow. That is, that's a real, that's a real story right there. Yeah. I know you've got a plane to catch soon yeah. and I want to be respectful of your time. Is there something that I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? I 
I think we could chat for hours. It's we just, definitely could. Yeah. We'll do this again. How about that? Yeah. We'll I, have part I, two. I love that. I think uh, I love how you have made, how you've led in vulnerability and how you've been transparent about the struggle. It'd be really easy to walk in the doors and just have your mouth drop open at this was way less than 1% in the nation, the operation that you have here and the team um, and your leadership team. And I think that it, we shouldn't ever forget those struggle days. They've really served us to get us where we are. And I feel like such a need to say, if you're listening and you found yourself nodding at a couple of those talking points that we had to keep pushing on, it gets better. It's worthy of the fight. Remember what we're fighting for and our why. It's our families and it's quality of life that it's more than work, that you got stuck in the trap for years. And I don't ever want to forget, but I want to really appreciate how generous you have been with your time and the vulnerability and just coming alongside you in that cheerleading. What we do is hard. Yeah. That's really hard. I'm so appreciative that, that yeah. you came to, came to see me today. And by the way, for any contractors that are listening out there, if maybe they're thinking about, hey, I need something more than bookkeeping. Could they reach out to you? Absolutely. And it, if so, what's yeah. the best way to get in contact with you? I'll just throw out my email address right now. It's Annie, A-N-I-E, at ProfitWorksUSA.com. That's P-R-O-F-I-T-W-O-R-K-S-U-S-A.com. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Contractors, thank you for tuning in. By the way, don't forget to, to join our Contractor Freedom Facebook group. And uh, connect up with Annie if you've got any questions. And she's just an amazing person. I know you'll be better off for it. So God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you.